Uh, well, thank you everybody for uh, for the time today. Um, today's a special day on the service and for all of us, uh, it's an opportunity to remember our colleague, uh, Sanjeev Bhatia, who uh, passed in 2018. Um, for those who don't know Sanjeev or didn't have a chance to work with him, uh, he was um, uh, came to us at, at the University of, uh, of Miami, fully trained uh, after training at one of the foremost neurosurgical centers in India, uh, the All India Institute of Medicine. Uh, since you came to the NIH to do research uh, on temporal lobe anatomy with an interest in epilepsy, spent some time at the Boston VA, and then uh, was induced to come work with Roberto and Jacques uh, as their fellow um, before deciding that he was gonna stay in the States. Uh, and he and Rita and the family uh, stayed with us in Miami. Sanjeev was a resident with us. Uh, he was so capable uh, when he came that he was sort of rapidly progressed through the program. He was our first fellow in pediatric neurosurgery, then became part of the faculty thereafter. And um, Sanjeev was one of those people, if you didn't know him, uh, he was, uh, for the most part, relatively mild-mannered and soft-spoken um, um, and had the label by the residents of Uncle Sanjeev because he had the wisdom of an uncle and the ability to mentor uh, us without being overbearing. So. Uh, we miss him as a friend and colleague, and after he passed, we created this uh, lectureship in his honor, and we're, we can't be more uh, pleased to have uh, Jim Drake with us uh, uh, to honor Sanjeev's memory. Um, Jim is the Surgeon-in-Chief at Sick Children's Hospital uh, in Toronto. Um, he's also the Chief of Perioperative Services, and I'm sure he'll need a drink to tell us all the stories of dealing with uh, itinerant surgeons and other types, but uh, it's, he's managed to stick it out for a couple of years now as Surgeon-in-Chief. Uh, he's also the uh, professor and chair of surgery at the University of Toronto. Um, uh, Jim is, uh, was the fifth in a long line of distinguished surgeons to lead the uh, neurosurgery at SickKids. Uh, and um, there's uh, Dr. William Keith, the first pediatric neurosurgeon of note really at SickKids and, and then the three H's. Um, and it was, uh, it was really the two gyms that sort of evolved the, the, the service. And uh, these are photographs from a paper that Andrew J wrote uh, and published in the journal Neurosurgery uh, in, 20, in 2007. Uh, the three H's who created uh, arguably the world's busiest pediatric neurosurgery ser service and the most distinguished evolved with the two leadership of the two gyms to make it probably one of the most scientifically based and creative as well as busiest clinical service uh, uh, in North America, if not the world. So Jim's um, uh, going to talk to us today about innovation, which is really actually very interesting because as a I tell people that if, if I wasn't a neurosurgeon, I'd be an engineer uh, because I like to tinker and solve problems with my hands. Um, and uh, that's how Jim started his education in engineering. And I think he's applied a great deal of what he's learned uh, at the university to his practice in medicine. Um, Jim's also a great friend and he was tortured uh, in this effort to try to get from uh, Newport to Rhode Island to Bermuda. Um, as is true for sailors, when things don't go well, we change plans and instead of sailing to Maine, when the weather got really rough in the Gulf Stream, we headed across the Cape Cod Canal and had a beautiful sail to Maine um, that ended with this at the top of uh, Acadia National Park and a spectacular view of the ocean. Um, we're really, uh, I can't thank you enough, Jim, for taking time on, on your busy schedule to do this for us. We're really looking forward to your talk. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks very much, John. I'm absolutely delighted uh, to be invited to give this lecture and so honored that it is in uh, Sanjeev's name. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, we have a long-standing relationship uh, with you, and but also a number of your faculty. And it's good to see Al uh, Levy again, uh, who trained here in Toronto these many years ago. So it's uh, a lot of close relationships with Miami. Um, so I am going to talk today about uh, an innovation project that I took over about a decade ago now. And um, uh, it's a little different than what I've been doing before, and I'm hoping you'll find it of some interest. So, you know, I think uh, Al summed up very well uh, in this comment about Sanjeev as a brilliant neurosurgeon and totally de dedicated to his patients and teaching and, um, you know, also very involved in global neurosurgery. And my contact with them was mainly through, um, you know, I, I called them up a couple of times about epilepsy cases and in particular uh, insular recording and insular resections. And uh, he, he was an extraordinarily 
accomplished individual in that regard and, and, and very modest. And, you know, I didn't spend a lot of time with him, but it just so happened um, that uh, at the um, IFNE World Congress of Neuroendoscopy in 2017, which is in Cape Town, um, we ended up spending the day together. And I, I saw on the, um, on the um, list of people here that his wife, Rita, is, I think, on the call. And I, I just wanted to comment on his personal attributes because we spent the whole day together and I think we really got to know each other much better. And he's kind of a kindred spirit in that we decided in the morning that we'd go and climb Table Mountain and if no plans whatsoever, um, you know, we showed up, you know, no water, uh, probably the wrong footwear um, and it was blistering hot day. And ultimately we decided just to take the cable car up. Uh, so we spent the afternoon doing that and it was absolutely wonderful. And, um, and uh, he was very concerned about my driving because we were driving on the left side of the highway with a stick shift, which I thought I was pretty okay with, but he was gripping the sides of the, you know, the car with all his strength uh, and, and, and trying to navigate at the same time. And then that evening we went to uh, Llewellyn Patachai's house and, uh, San, and Sanjeev got right to work and uh, he decided he's a good cook, he's gonna make the salad. So he was wonderful, I think, in every way. And I just can't imagine how much you and his family miss him and what a loss it was for him to pass away so suddenly at such a young age. So I think he's someone that we can all aspire to be more like. And I'm again, so thrilled to be able to, uh, to give this lecture. So uh, John alluded to my background, which was in engineering and uh, where I ended up, as I said, this last decade. And this is kind of where we ended up working. And this is the uh, interface between um, engineers and, um, and surgeons and a large group of other medical professionals. And this is a, a book we put together uh, several years ago with Waleed Farhat there on the left, and he's a urologist. And there are two of our MD, PhD students working on a surgical robot that I'll show you a little bit about later. But this is the kind of, and both these individuals came from an engineering background. So this is the kind of group that we're trying to bring together to see if we can advance the technology, particularly for pediatric neurosurgery, but as I'll show you also beyond. And uh, the woman there on the left was uh, Amy, and she made this um, video, if it, uh, okay, um, about what the beauty is all about. And I, we actually are in the hospital. So we're up in a lab in the hospital. Uh, we have an MRI across the street, but. And this is uh, one of our Dimitri test kits. Um, as I said, it's uh, hard science and engineering focus. He's one of our robot controllers, a lot of 3D printing. And um, this is one of our neurosurgical robot uh, prototypes that I'll show you in a second. And this is some of our 3D printing for, um, for skulls. And, and these are all, uh, this, so this gentleman came from um, Applied Math. And uh, this is a plastic surgery resident who did a PhD, and that's a ventilator uh, for premature that was created by a group of CPM, uh, pediatric intensive care units. And that's the young man, gentleman who's now in medical school uh, and doing a residency in radiology. And this is our focus focus on machine. That's a very quick. Uh, spectrum of what we're involved with. And, and these are kind of the main areas that we're focused on. So one is developing minimally invasive tools for a variety of surgeries, including neurosurgery. Um, tools for other um, applications, and that's actually an endoscopic tool for uh, the GI tract. Uh, 3D printing to develop models, which we really started in order to develop ro robots. And then using a uh, focused ultrasound for a variety of applications, uh, including in the brain. 
And the focus ultrasound machine is actually, when you take it apart, it's actually a robot. And this is the group that we have brought together. So as I said, it's about two thirds engineers and one third physicians, uh, medical students, um, uh, postdocs, um, all working together in our lab and working on uh, projects. Uh, okay. Like this, and th this was a uh, an auto suturing robot. This is the, one of the first projects that I kind of inherited, uh, designed to automatically um, sew structures together, include including in this case um, a, a, a synthetic vessel. So this was, I thought, you know, extremely aspirational. And after five years, we did have a system that. Um, would auto suture about the same speed as a surgeon, um, but it really didn't seem to be a huge advance in that regard. And getting robots so that they're surgical robots, so they're totally autonomous, something like we envisioned for, um, you know, self-driving cars, I, I think it's still a ways off. And often it's the simpler um, systems that actually, um, uh, I think are gonna come into um, application much quicker. And we've also done work with simulation and immersive uh, reality. So this is one of our early prototypes. So this is an MRI compatible robot that was designed to do biopsies. And so in this particular application, um, we're using it to biopsy bone, but we've also um, developed a version that would do brain biopsy and actually another one for uh, inserting um, radioactive uh, needles into the prostate. So it's kind of the area that we're working in and that we develop a robotic system. So this one um, is MRI compatible, can work uh, in the MRI while the MRI is taking images, um, which is um, which is difficult to do with the current um, motors and, um, and, and technology that we have available. But that was uh, a prototype that we're using now and we're hoping to get that into clinical practice, in fact, for prostate in the, in the very near future. And I guess one of the common themes uh, you'll hear, and you hear this a lot in medical robots, is that people do, you know, preclinical testing, but actually getting devices to humans is actually quite challenging. And, and this is the, uh, as I said, the MR guided focus ultrasound machine. And, and this is not a cranial system. This is a body system. This is the Philips system that has a transducer uh, in the table. And we've used it for a large variety of applications that I'll talk to you about. But I think one of the most interesting parts of this uh, is the interest that the clinicians uh, have in this type of technology transfer. And we've tried to set up a system where clinicians from a variety of specialties uh, come with a problem that they want to solve and looking for an engineering uh, solution of one sort or another. Uh, and, and the real advantage of that from my point of view is that you know, when and if we can get this to the patient, then they're the ones who are really gonna drive the technology forward. So in, in a lot of instances, and we've been in that position, we've developed the technology looking for an application. And I think it's a much more difficult and likely to be more unsuccessful than having a system like this. And I'm not gonna go through all of these individuals, but um, they're all from other specialties than neurosurgery. So uh, ear, nose and throat, general surgery, uh, neonatal intensive care, urology, anesthesia, plastic surgery, and at the bottom are some engineering collaborators. And this is the same in our uh, focused ultrasound program. So these are, again, our core faculty, our postdocs and staff, students, and our faculty that are involved. And if you ask me what is our biggest contribution uh, to date, I think a lot of it would have to do as an education and training center. So there's been a large interest in students uh, from various um, backgrounds, usually the hard sciences or medicine coming through. And at, at, at the moment, we have a group of about 30 and over the past, we've changed, trained a large number of um, PhD master's students and undergrads, in particular um, undergrads in, 
and engineering and in particular robotics. And we've also um, tried to get people interested early. So this is a uh, robotics challenge we held with high school students and they challenged us to build a um, neurosurgical biopsy robot out of Lego Mindstorm. And then some of these children, some of these students have come forward and then started to take up a position in the lab in, in one sort or another. So I think this is a good way to get people interested in this early. And this is, I'm just listing here, some of the um, master student uh, thesis topics. I'm not gonna go through them, but it is a wide range of applications uh, for medical uh, applications for either tools, robotics, or uh, MR guided procedures. And these are the, again, the PhD or MD PhD students who have also come through the lab. So as I said, we, I think we are somewhat unique and I think we have an advantage by being in the hospital and, and this mixture of, uh, of clinical and engineering faculty and students. And um, we are in the technology transfer area, um, which is I think relatively new for a lot of uh, universities and, in, and also in the University of Toronto, but one of high interest. And we do, try to have industrial partnerships uh, and have had a few spin-offs and startups um, uh, over, over this, but uh, like many, it's a, it's a very difficult path to follow. And I've talked about some of the advantages of this. So as I said, my particular interest has been in endoscopy and robotics and I, you know, I think I'm showing what are the limitations that we currently have. And so this is a patient with a small um, metastatic lesion in the back of the third ventricle with fairly large um, ventricles themselves. And this is one of the tumors that we can remove uh, surgically at the moment. And so this is, uh, you know, coming in through the framing of Monroe, uh, we're a fairly anterior approach. You can see the tumor here, um, on the side of the ventricle, it's relatively avascular and it's small, and uh, and you know with biopsy forceps we can we can remove a piece of it. There's not any bleeding, and then using uh, a Nico device we can shave it down. But if we did get any significant bleeding, there's not much that you know you can really do, uh, and you could be there for a long time irrigating. And so what we're trying to develop are systems and tools that could. Uh, reproduce uh, or um, uh, situation so that you could do almost the same thing you could with an open procedure. And, and Mark Suedain, I think, summarizes very well in terms of purity endoscopic removal of brain tumors. Um, what are the shortcomings? And as you see, bipolar forceps was the number one. And so bleeding is the part that really um, makes this very limiting and where you can quickly lose control. Um, we talked about uh, an ultrasonic aspirator or tissue shaver and then 3D endoscopy. So this is the sort of thing we ended up working on. And so like many centers, we tried to produce a miniature da Vinci uh, because that's what has been so widespread throughout the world and has been used hundreds of thousands of operations. Um, but we need two millimeter instruments and um, you can't really scale a da Vinci down to that level. And we, as well as a number of others have tried. And the, the, the instruments are either too fragile or, or they're, they're so small, you can't fabricate them. If you can fabricate them, you um, are very difficult to assemble. And if you can assemble them, uh, they're not very robust. But this is a different concept. This is a concentric tube robot. and uh, these are curved nitinol tubes and they remember their shape. So they have shape memory. And by rotating them and moving them um, backwards and forwards, you can actually produce a workspace that looks like this. So this is where the tool comes out of the end of the scope. And then it goes out into an area like this. So this is exactly the kind of workspace we'd be interested in. We're showing one of our designs here with three tubes. So two working channels and then a suction or aspiration channel here. Um, and, and their industrial strength, so they're extremely strong. So those are the kind of things that we think might be the solution for a miniature uh, neurosurgical robot. 
these are some of the dexterity features that we're interested in. As I said, we want something that can generate significant forces and is reasonably fast and also accurate. And we're designing these systems around specific patients. So this is a patient with a pineal tumor, and this is a simulation of, um, of the ventricles. This is a tumor here itself, and this is the type of concentric tube robot that we would need in order to uh, remove this tumor. And this is, again, one of our, this is, I think, version number two. And um, as, as you'll see, it's got uh, two, two, um, two um, working instruments. Um, they're uh, scissors and, and graspers. And a lot of this design is done on simulators. Um, this is, it's teleoperated, So it's a master-slave system, uh, very much like uh, what the Da Vinci uses. This is the workspace that I talked about. And these are the op overlapping workspaces for the two tools. Uh, it's uh, quite accurate in terms of, um, uh, of its uh, precision. And, um, um, and these are validating its performance. And this is what the device looks like um, on the bench. Uh, these are the two working tools. And, it, and so we're getting to the point where it's actually starting to do things that we're really interested in. And so this is a standard um, peg transfer that any robotic system is usually tested on. But what we're really interested in is trying to do things that we can't do um, at, at the moment. And, um, and that's picking something up and cutting it. So if you've ever tried to do this um, with uh, the standard endoscopic instruments, this is really hard. And the instruments are not curved, they're straight, so you can't really see beyond them. And, and so this is obviously, um, you know, just a demonstration, but we're going to pick up a piece of thread and cut it. And so those are the kind of things that um, we're, we're very interested in trying to uh, develop. And this is our third version. This is our current version. And uh, we now have three arms. You can see it's getting larger and larger, but it does work inside a 3D printed model of the brain. We've used this in some animal testing. And we actually have a collaboration with a group at Boston Children's to develop a, um, a device that we can uh, believe use in humans. The other procedures that we're interested in are uh, min minimally invasive hemispherotomy, and this is the same system, um, same idea, but for a different application. And um, what I haven't told you, some of the downsides of concentric tubes. So there's, there's two of them. One is uh, controlling collisions between the two arms. You obviously don't want them. Um, hitting one another, um, and and the other is that they tend to generate um, forces, uh, internal forces, when they're put in particular positions. And so, when the curves are exactly opposite to one another and straight, they retain a lot of energy. And then, if they move beyond that, they can suddenly move more than a, a few millimeters at one time. So it's all, it's not quite uncontrolled, but it's sl slightly unpredictable. But you can modify these tubes with, with a laser cutter, for example, here, and make it so it has a very smooth uh, profile. The other things we've been working on is uh, modifying these tubes, um, which, as I said, are, are shape memory alloys. And, but you can remove parts of the material to make them, uh, to increase their curvature so that you can uh, bend them into more acute angles and also increase the strength by doing that. And this is a couple of examples of that. So. I'm going to talk about models in a, in a minute, but we actually got into the modeling area basically to test the robotics devices. And um, this is an example of, uh, of that, um, of, of using this model to test a robotic system um, in a, this is going through the frame and open row and um, doing a, a third ventriculostomy. So that's, you know, that's not a system you need a robot for, but that's a way of, we can test these robotic devices on models first before moving uh, to any animal testing. Um, and then we, we've um, become part of a very large um, international consortium, I guess, that has these Da Vinci test kits. So these are older Da Vinci's that have been repurposed and, um, and, and basically donated by Intuitive uh, without the um, 
without their software and hardware controllers, but the group has developed our own hardware uh, and software controllers. And we can use these as a test bed um, so that you don't have to you know, build a new robot every time you want to test a different tool. You can just mount it on this DaVinci test kit. And it's a, it's a very standardized platform. So we've been using that a lot. And this is one where um, if you've ever seen a DaVinci, this is what the standard DaVinci uh, connection system looks like. There's four uh, spools that are controlled and then we can build and 3D print the rest of it fairly quickly and we can um, prototype these fairly rapidly. And it's now a long time ago, but we actually won um, uh, the, sur the uh, surgical challenge at the Hamlin robotic uh, symposium with uh, such a system. So this is one, uh, this is a concentric tube device uh, on a Da Vinci. And you can see that it does move pretty quickly and has a fairly large um, workspace and um, is actually uh, quite controllable. So, so this is what we think is a good test bed and we'll, we'll give some other examples of that. And we actually kind of unknown until this point, but we actually did win this, so very proud of that. And uh, we've actually won various elements of this competition a couple of times since then. Um, of course, it was taken out last year by COVID. The whole thing was canceled. So we're hoping that it'll uh, happen this year. And, and these are examples of some of the engineering students at the University of Toronto as part of their fourth year thesis working on um, different tools. So I mentioned that uh, one of the big problems with um, interventricular surgery is having a bipolar that is uh, that works. And I'm just gonna show you very quickly, this is part of our, uh, one of our submissions to the surgical challenge. We've mounted a, a robotic bipolar device on a Da Vinci test kit and um, use it here on, a, I think it's a mango. And so, um, so this is, so, so we think the bipolar is a very key um, part of this. And I'm just showing how you know, we could use this bipolar to go around corners and, uh, and uh, coagulate blood vessels. And you can actually compress them first and then apply the cautery and then remove them. And you know, we're looking at ways that we could actually also clean them. Um, and this is um, another version uh, on a DaVinci system. This is a slightly different um, configuration of the tubes, but this is doing surgery inside a red pepper using the DaVinci test kit with two, um, two millimeter arms. <clears throat> this is the sort of thing be very difficult with a, with a standard uh, endoscopic system. So, 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 these, so we're, and we're obviously exploring a variety of approaches and I mentioned our collaboration with uh, Pierre DuPont at Boston Children's and the ultimate goal was to create something that would be totally MRI compatible um, at, at this stage, we're actually building something that's not MRI compatible, just uh, to make sure that we have all the issues uh, ironed out and we're about to start animal testing with this particular system. So as I mentioned, it's not just neurosurgery and this is a tool that was developed uh, by our ENT collaborators and the graduate students in the lab. Uh, to do endoscopic surgery um, inside the external canal. And um, another submission to the surgical challenge, as you can see, um, Family Medical Robotics Challenge. And um, just very quickly, this is the type of prototype that we can you know, put together reasonably quickly. And, and this was actually um, uh, a PhD thesis for um, one of our graduate students who's now actually over at uh, Imperial College where the Hamlin Robotics uh, program is. And um, just an example of the type of, and this robotic system could obviously be used for, for other applications. So we've also been looking at some more novel uh, instrument design. So this is a collaboration with uh, one of the uh, professors of mechanical engineering who's interested in micro robotics. And th this is a magnetic LED control system. So these are grippers that are have magnets on them and you control them with external magnets. And um, just show here what um, these uh, devices can do. So. This is working inside the framing of Monroe. And um, 
there's nothing controlling this but the external magnets, right? So it's going to pick up a P and then bring it back out. And this is um, where we see this technology potentially headed. This is an untethered robot. So this is actually something that you could theoretically inject. This is about uh, four millimeters in size. And it's being controlled at the top here by uh, external magnets. And it's going to come up here. It's a pair of scissors. And it's going to come up here and uh, cut this piece of plastic uh, in half. Uh, there you go. And um, this is another application for um, cleft palate repair. So this is the Da Vinci test kit, and this is one of our cleft palate uh, simulators. And uh, the standard Da Vinci instruments, which have been used on occasion in the adult uh, airway, are not are too big for um, you know eight month old infants when this repair is quickly done, typically done. So we're working on that as a um, as a um, as a as a as a new tool design. So I, I just it, we're just do so it, on this on the left side that's a standard five millimeter Da Vinci tool, and uh, on the right is our uh, three millimeter um, prototype. And there are no uh, three three millimeter um, uh, Da Vinci tools that um, at the moment that are available. So that so but we have mounted this on a Da Vinci test kit. So the Da Vinci system does not have uh, feedback. Uh, it's one of the issues uh, where some of the complications have arisen because uh, you cannot tell what you're pressing on. And so I think feedback uh, is important. It's very hard to do it uh, mechanically um, just because of the design of the robotic systems. They tend to become a little unstable. And this is a bone condu conduction hearing feedback system that records the stress on the tip of the instrument and it's fed back to uh, the surgeon as um, as with bone conduction headphones so that it doesn't create a lot of noise you can still hear everything that's going on but you also do hear what the um, stress on the tip of the instruments is and uh, you know we're also looking at other uh, applications and so this is um, we have a, a, a college of art uh, just uh, down the street from us and one of the professors there has um, produced he's a sculptor he's produced a fetal model of um, of the pregnant abdomen and fetus uh, for a variety of applications and including uh, simulation of um, myelomeningocele so this happens to be a chicken breast but this is a real uh, 24 week size fetus it's inside a 20 about a 24 week uh, abdomen and we've been using uh, the Da Vinci uh, to do the repair. So right now, many centers are moving to laparoscopic repair of myelomeningocele. It, it's a very lengthy operation and uh, they're using three millimeter tools. And so we're trying to develop um, tools for that application uh, on our Da Vinci test kit. And um, so <clears throat> with, the, with the Da Vinci test kit, we can do this repair in about uh, 11 minutes. So sort of thing we think uh, in terms of fetal surgery might, might, might have a significant future. So I'm, I'm gonna move on now to modeling because that's also been a large part of what we've been involved in. And this is projects that are driven by the craniofacial surgeons and their idea is to standardize craniofacial surgery. And um, so what they've done is uh, taken a large volume of normal uh, heads from CT scans that were done for other reasons in eight to 12 month olds and created this normal skull and uh, can scale it for the age between eight and 12 months and then design these templates that fit uh, over over the uh, skull in the operating room. You can, you can do it virtually as I'll show you in a minute, but you can also they're also brought to the operating room for the, uh, for the actual repair. So this is it virtually. So this is a patient with metopic synostosis. And for this particular patient, this is what their skull should look like uh, when they're finished. And uh, this is using that tool. This is what the result was. And this is the virtual 
template put over top of this. And this is how it's used in the operating room. This is um, before the skull's taken off. This is um, where the cuts are made and we've optimized these cuts with another project. Um, and then the um, bandeau is shaped to the, to the template and then the reconstruction is done. And these are you know, early results, but um, they've, they've shown a, a better correction. Um, but also what's really interesting with this technique is you can also tell if there's been any kind of uh, relapse in terms of return of the deformity. We're also working on a project to make this minimally. So we're, we're, most of us are doing minimally invasive uh, strip craniectomies now if, with the younger children. Um, and we're trying to uh, expand that to a robotic system. This is an ultrasonic cutting tool that would work on a da Vinci uh, system. I'm showing it here. And um, again, that's another area that we've been working in. So just wanna talk a little bit about um, what we're calling therapeutic imaging using, using focused ultrasound. And uh, as I said, this is, a, this is a body system. And so one of the first applications we did was with for um, uh, benign osteoid osteomas. And so this is, uh, so we developed this uh, in an animal model. It had been done um, in Europe uh, on a number of patients, uh, but not in North America. But so we developed this in an animal model we also have animal models of interventricular hemorrhage that I'll show you uh, for going through the infant skull. So uh, this is uh, the first patient in North America that we treated with an osteoid osteoma. We've now treated a, a series of these patients and we've developed it for another um, of related applications um, for, um, for um, osteoid osteomas in other locations uh, for um, metastatic bone lesions, for soft tissue lesions, um, uh, particularly the one we're interested in is neuroblastoma, but also for peripheral nerve and also for tendons. Uh, for the interventricular hemorrhage model, um, we're doing this based on the ultrasound window of a, a neonatal skull. As I said, we've developed an animal model for this and we can show that we can uh, lyse the clots using particular uh, focused ultrasound sequence um, uh, in, in these animal models. Uh, and we also have some uh, early results on longer term follow-up studies in, in terms of trying to decrease the incidence of hydrocephalus in, in these porcine models. And this is the concept in terms of how this would be used uh, in, a, in a premature neonate. And this is the robotic system that could be adapted for that particular application, but also a number of others. And we've also been looking at um, using focused ultrasound, like other, and other centers have started uh, to look at this. Um, and, and, and some adults have been treated, and actually Miami is one of the first, I think, uh, John um, uh, and Travis Tierney to treat um, a hypothalamic hamartoma with focused ultrasound. And this is again in an animal model using white matter ablation. And I, I'm not gonna dwell on this uh, too much longer, but um, you can show that we can ablate obviously a fairly accurately white matter tracks. And these are pre and post um, DTI images. In a, this, this is in a neonatal pig. And I mentioned, um, um, no, this is the, these are lesions uh, in the brain and uh, these are, uh, this is um, peripheral nerve. So you could do neurotomies uh, with uh, focused ultrasound. And then we're also looking at liquid biopsies. So <clears throat> using low dose ultrasound, you can um, cause transient disruption of blood brain barrier for up to four hours it appears to be almost completely reversible. You occasionally see some small hemorrhages. Um, so we're working with uh, a group at the University of Toronto that are developing various micro bubbles and liposome encapsulated micro bubbles. And um, we're developing a system to do liquid biopsies. So liquid biopsies now done for the, through the CSF uh, is under investigation and we're looking at this to see if we can do this uh, through the bloodstream. 
So using encapsulated liposomes, um, disrupting the blood-brain barrier with low-dose focused ultrasound. And our target uh, model is for uh, diffuse intrinsic pungent gliomas. Um, so all these technologies have their shortcomings. Um, the focused ultrasound is obviously, it's not invasive. <clears throat> you, um, the concentration of ultrasound causes a lot of effects. I've talked about blood brain barrier disruption at low intensity. Um, a lot of times it's used it for thermal ablation. So that's where it's used for essential tremor. Um, but the ultrasound beam doesn't stop at the, um, at the target site, it keeps going. And um, so injury to structures either in the path, such as the skin or beyond, such as the skull base are not insignificant. And if you're doing this anywhere else in the body, then movement's extremely important. And so this is a system to compensate for the motion of the diaphragm if you wanted to treat for something exact like a neuroblastoma. Um, and we're also very interested in, in fetal applications. And so I mentioned uh, in utero uh, closure of myelomeningocele, but we're also interested in non-invasive treatments. And so um, the placenta and the fetus are actually um, very good ultrasound targets, if you like, because they're in a water bath and you could um, have a transducer held by the robotic system that we've developed to treat um, you know, fetal abnormalities. And, and some of the target ones are sacrococcygeal teratomas and other masses that could be treated. Right now they're treated <clears throat> with percutaneous thermal ablation and the same for um, separating the plant set up for twin twin transfusion. And so uh, we've just got a grant to pursue this with, uh, with MR guided focused ultrasound. Um, and these are some of the tools that you need to design. So um, I'm just going to, um, as I said, I'm sort of giving you a tour of what we've been up to. And as I mentioned, we got into modeling more to design robots, but it became quickly apparent pretty quickly that these also edu excellent educational tools. And so, you know, we're not new to simulation training in neurosurgery. I mean, this is one of the uh, University of Western Ontario uh, grad students who's a neurosurgeon uh, now in Kingston, um, did a uh, survey on the usefulness of, um, of neuroendoscopy uh, for training. And obviously there's a lot of enthusiasm for this. And this is the simulator, as I said, we initially designed for a, uh, to test a robot, but um, uh, a PhD student uh, from the Netherlands really took this uh, to over the top and we've developed this down to a simulator that we use regularly. We actually also brought this to different conferences, including the one in, in Cape Town. Um, and it simulates a third ventriculostomy, which I will just show you here. So this is Gerben Bremer, he's the PhD student. And this is in the lab. Um, this is uh, one of the simulations and this is uh, what it looks like. Uh, when you're inside uh, the ventricle, it's the choroid plexus, that's the floor of the third ventricle. We use a blunt instrument to perforate the floor, and then we'll use a grasping forceps. This is what we do here in the operating room. We also use balloons, but um, can also you know, simulate complications such as bleeding. So we have simulators, I won't go over all of them, but we have simulators for um, third ventriculostomy, for choroid plexus coagulation, for tumor biopsy, for uh, colloid cyst <clears throat> excision and for cranial synostosis surgery. And these are, we hold these courses um, at least annually. And as I said, we've taken them to other venues and we also have a virtual reality uh, simulator that I'll show you in a second. So we've, we validated the third ventriculostomy model and, and uh, we validated it as a training tool. Um, where is simulation headed? I think it's very hard to predict. So this is, um, Virtual reality simulators developed by the National Research Council in um, in Quebec. So we have the Earth Journal's purchased this instrument, and this is a simulator for a third ventriculostomy. And the graphics are amazing, um, and you can see the cord plexus is beating um, in the breeze. And 
Um, in a minute, it'll show the third ventriculostomy. Um, so that's the floor of the third ventricle. <clears throat> but um, it does have some haptic feedback, but um, it's, you know, I think it's fair to say it's still under development. Um, sorry. Uh, and the, the individual failed because they were going to go through the mammillary body, which, okay, and that's the third ventriculostomy. So we've compared these two and, you know, there's advantages to both. And um, I think the, um, the the graphics are better with uh, the, the realism of the environment is better with the simulator, the, the uh, virtuality simulator, but the using the tools and having absolute, you know, virt, uh, real haptic feedback was seen as better by the students when we compared them. And this is the college simulator. I won't go too, but this is the, Metopic synostosis simulator, um, and this is a sagittal synostosis uh, simulator. Um, and um, you know, we 3D print these, and then um, we also have you know bleeding scenarios for these as well. And we're also using these to develop our endoscopic um, bone cutting robot. And uh, you know, I've, and we've validated these to some extent. We have we haven't shown that this actually improves someone's performance in the operating room, which is what you actually need to do with a simulator to show it's, I think, of uh, enormous value. But um, anyways, we're uh, we're on the road. And, and then um, one of the cardiac. Uh, radiologists got very involved in 3D printing uh, infant hearts with congenital malformation. And this has launched a whole cardiac training module that's now used all around the world. And, um, and 3D printing, I haven't said a lot about this, but 3D printing patients is something that we do quite frequently. Um, and, um, and, and also uh, for, for the cardiac surgeons. So I'm, I'm strained now beyond uh, neurosurgery. This is a, as a neonatal simulator for uh, premature infants that was developed by one of the radiologists. And I'm showing this just because a little bit of the background. So this was um, designed by one of our intensive care physicians who unfortunately uh, passed away uh, last year um, un unexpectedly. Um, and he developed this for ARDS, which everybody uh, knows about. And um, the idea is that he would create an iron lung uh, that would go around the abdomen. And this um, would uh, decrease the abdominal pressure and increase the perfusion in the lungs. And this is the kind of idea that, um, you know, someone, he came up to the lab, he got talking to some of the students, they 3D printed this cage, it's controlled by an Arduino which is a hobby computer that costs about uh, $35. And uh, we tested it uh, on the students. And then um, in May, so, there, uh, so he set up a clinical trial, which, which got stalled you know, when he got ill. And then um, it, was, uh, it was relaunched in the middle of the pandemic. And um, it, it actually went into clinical trials and because it was at more than one center, we needed Health Canada approval. Um, and this is right in the middle. And so we got Health Canada approval in one day to, to yeah, put this device in the clinical trials. And I, we have not seen the results yet, but it, just a sort of very simple device, um, you know, got it to humans um, and, it's, and, it's, and it's been tested. So I've showed some very complicated projects that have taken a very long time and then it's some of the most uh, clever and uh, innovative ones that are simple that actually uh, get launched the fastest. So I'm gonna finish up there. Um, so I've hoping I've given you a tour of what we've been up to over this last uh, decade. Um, I think some of the points I wanna make is that I think this is a good way to drive innovation in medical technology. Um, I love this collaborative ventures uh, approach. I, I think having the mixture of engineering students and medical people mixed in together, uh, working together in the lab is really a, creates a positive environment. 
there's a lot of interest uh, in this amongst the physicians in the, here in the hospital and beyond. And, and finally, you know, pediatrics often gets left behind with uh, new technology. Uh, it's designed for adults. It's a much larger market. Um, and, and, and the incidence of disease in pediatric patients is often much less. But, um, you know, we do need devices that are specific for them. And, um, and if we do are able to design them and get them out to pediatric patients, they, they also would probably work in, in certain adult scenarios. So again, I just wanna thank you very much for inviting me. It's been a great honor uh, to give this uh, lecture in, in memory of uh, Sanjeev and uh, really uh, appreciate the invitation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. That was really spectacular. Uh, I mean, the body of work and the amount of material covered, uh, any one of those topics would be a great hour lecture. Um, we could fill the entire grand round schedule with your, with your work. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to um, take advantage of the first question. So, you know, one of the real challenges, Jim, has always been um, depth perception when you do endoscopy. And I, I'm sure that's one of the things you guys have taken into consideration Maybe you can answer that why other people like fight for who can ask the next question. And then of course, my next request is an Alan Levy story from when he was a resident. So I'll, I'll let you go. Thank you, Jim, for doing well, that. Well, I could start by talking about Al's car, but I, I'm actually not gonna go there uh, when he was a resident, but no, he's sick of hearing about it. Yeah, so no, so I mean, the system that we're developing at the moment with the Da Vinci test kit is, the, so the Da Vinci is a binocular system and uh, it's, it's um, the image quality is unbelievable for anybody who has ever tried it. And you really do, you really do get the idea that you're immersed um, in the, um, in, in, in the, in the, in the surgical uh, environment. You really do get the feeling that you're immersed. Um, but it's also uh, 10 millimeters in diameter. So that's the scope. So, you know, we're working on miniaturized scopes and we looked at, uh, and, and we do have a uh, 3D um, binocular scope that's three millimeters. Uh, the image clarity is not the greatest and the closer you get the lenses together, the harder it is to create a real um, 3D field. But, um, but, but that is very much part of what we are trying to do. There are, um, you know, these, chips on cameras that are chips on tips that seem to be getting better and better. And so as long as you can separate them enough, I think you, um, I think you will get reasonable binocular vision. And I, I do think it is a, is a key, key component. I mean, if you talk to some of the adult skull-based surgeons, um, and you probably have some here, uh, I don't know that they're all convinced that 3D uh, view is, is, is that important, but I, I think it's, it's certainly, something that we want want to get to so to clarify that that current one is is two 10 millimeter scopes that give you binocular vision or both no so the da vinci is a it's a singular scope but it has you know it has two lenses and 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 it, it produces excellent binocular image but it's 10 millimeters in diameter wonderful thank you i'll, um... I'll ask a question if that's okay um so Obviously, as pediatric neurosurgeons, we're a very small market for a company like Da Vinci. I mean, urology has tons of procedures. Pediatric neurosurgery is a niche within neurosurgery. Have you faced any pushback from them of being interested in something that's such a small market? Um, or have they been a ready partner? And how have you dealt with that? Yeah, no, I mean, you know, the initial conversation, you know, usually starts out, well, is this about heart disease, stroke or diabetes? And, uh, but, you know, I think, I think that there has been success in, in, in niche markets. And, you know, I, I do think that if we develop a system that'll work in a pediatric patient, I think you could also use it in adults. So that's, so that's what we have to certainly think about. You know, we have not had great success in, um, in engaging companies, and most of them will want to see evidence of clinical efficacy before they, because that's where the risk is, and they are not really willing to assume those risks. So, um, you know, I, you know, I, I, I would say that the uh, the Rosa systems and the Neuromate, they're kind of niche market, right? Um, and yet they've been pretty much embraced. So, 
nothing like the Da Vinci, but I, I still think that there's, um, I, I still think that there's, that this, that this, these are viable propositions. And, um, you know, one of our PhD students uh, spun off the cleft palate simulator uh, and, and that was recently acquired by a, um, by a NGO. So it, it can happen and, but it's, it's hard. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, Jim, this is Jacques Morcos. Uh, I greatly enjoyed your, your presentation. I remember 20 years ago, we tried actually to collaborate from our lab with Donald Sutherland in Calgary when he was trying to, well, when he was working on his robot, but you're absolutely right, the haptics is a big problem, isn't it? I mean, that really limits what you can do. We're interested in, you know, automating bypasses and so forth. Do, do you see this as a stumbling block in the future of replicating surgical skill, I guess? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I, 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 think it, I think it's doable. I mean, there are other ways of providing haptic feedback than, than force sensors, but that's certainly a big part of it. Um, you, you know, I, I have a feeling that um, the evolution is kind of going to be like it is with self-driving cars. So now you now have cars that um, are, are self-driving, but you have to have a pat, you have to have a driver there sitting with his hands practically on the wheel. And so I, th I think that would likely be the initial stages. Um, there are things that you can do with robots that um, that that you can't do with humans, and, and that's when you get down to you know submillimeter scales of movement and you know removing tremor and um and you can also uh, enforce boundaries that you cannot go beyond so, so so that's where i think it'll likely have the role i mean you know des designing a robot to do a third ventriculostomy i don't think is because that actually works quite well but you know designing one to remove a tumor i think that is something that may have more traction. I mean, you have to be careful about uh, underestimating um, surgeons' ingenuity and skill, right? Uh, it's, it, that is extraordinarily hard to duplicate. But if you can facilitate it, and if you can enhance it, that's where I think probably the it, advantage is. Agree. Thank you very much. Other questions for Dr. Drake? All right, Jim, I got one for you. So uh, it's time to buy a new microscope uh, here at Children's. And my sense is that we're not gonna be looking through the oculars of uh, a microscope hovering over the patients any longer. What do, you, what do you see in the future for how we do open microsurgery? Are we still gonna use a microscope like the ones we've used for the last 50 years? Yeah, I, uh, I gotta be careful here because I think I'm too old. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, so, you know, we've tried the, um, the overhead cameras, you know, with the display on the screen pretty diligently. And, um, you know, I had trouble relating to it. Um, so, uh, and, you know, the, um, and, and, and that there's, and I'm, and by the way, I'm not making a pitch for anybody here, but the do Zeiss microscope appears to do both and it's partly robotic. And um, so I'm, I'm not sure the microscope is over, but um, I think probably what this is gonna look like um, is that you're gonna be wearing glasses that, um, or you're gonna have projection, whatever you're looking at is gonna overlay all kinds of information that you really need in order to do the operation safely. And um, there'll be all kinds of feedback in terms of what's actually happening. And, um, and, and, and if you are doing this operation remotely with the patient in an MRI scanner, um, you know, the, the, you're gonna be looking at a, at a computer screen, um, not, not, not at, a, at a microscope. So, so those are some of the ways I think this might change, but I'd, I'd be interested in, in your experience with, uh, I forget the name of them now, but you know what I mean, the cameras that sit over top of the patient and you look at the, you look at the uh, three d display. So what, what, what's your experience been there? I, you know, those, those things they call exoscopes, I have no experience with, but um, 
it just seems to me that if, if there's something begging to be uh, uh, improved upon, it's the cumbersome machine with the giant drape yeah. uh, that hangs over the patient's head. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you'll, I'm sure your team will get to it. It's just a matter of time. Okay. Well, I, if we can't extract an L11 story from you, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, thank you really for this spectacular talk. For anybody interested, Dr. Drake's going to give a talk uh, uh, for the pediatric grand rounds at Nicholas Children's tomorrow morning at 8 on hydrocephalus. Uh, it's a topic that Jim has uh, written extensively about and is one of the world's authorities on. So we're really looking forward to that hydrocephalus talk. Uh, and I know the residents are looking forward to going over cases with you and, um, and sharing lunch virtually. So Jim, thank you so much for doing this and honoring us and the memory of Sanjeev. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, John. It's been an absolute um, honor and pleasure. And uh, just just want to finish by saying how much we all um, miss Sanjeev. Okay, bye. Thank you. We're looking forward to sharing a glass of wine tonight. We'll see you okay. in June tonight. Bye. Bye, bye. Thank you.